So I, uh, I figured, you know, a, a lot of times we hear, uh, you know, we, we talk about the Blythe relationship as it brings stability to us. And a lot of people think, is that just marketing, right? You know, how integrated and how involved Blythe really is. So I brought him here because I wanted him to be able to share firsthand uh, uh, how integrated it is. But before we do that, I want them to understand a little bit um, uh, more about you. Um, uh, you know, you were a first generation entrepreneur, uh, as I understand, raised by a single mother. Yep. And uh, is, yep. the, is this mic on? How are we doing? Okay, yep, yeah, that's, that's better. much better. Yep. So it, it, there's a lot of single mothers in the room. There's a lot of people that are first generation entrepreneurs like yeah. yourself. You know, what can you tell them in terms of, you know, what helped you along the way in your journey? Well, I think uh, uh, those of you who are single mothers uh, know that it's very important to set objectives for, your, for yourself and for your children. And uh, my mother was uh, very tough. And uh, even though uh, I actually had uh, three fathers, two stepfathers, and uh, <clears throat> but she was the she was the, the the river that ran deeply throughout all that relationships. And uh, she started talking to me about going to college, for example, when I didn't know any went about college. None of my siblings, her her, her brothers and sisters, never went to college, uh, and so I get broken up a little bit. Uh, she's passed away, but uh, to show you what kind of mother she was, when my younger brother went to college, she started college, and she graduated the same year he did. Wow. Uh, uh, now, 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 but she wanted to be a school teacher, and that's what she wanted to do, be a school teacher. Uh, 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 you know, speaking of college, uh, uh, I know that um, uh, you were rejected from Harvard, as I understand it. <laughs> no, no, no. They just didn't give me enough money to go there. Yeah, you, couldn't, you, couldn't, you couldn't afford to go to Harvard? I couldn't afford to go to Harvard. I couldn't afford to go to Harvard either. <laughs> I, I still couldn't afford that. Uh, yeah. um, and when you made the donation to Wharton for $25 million, was there any significance to that? Well, I didn't give $25 million. I only gave $10 million to Wharton, but I gave uh, $20 million to uh, University of Rochester, because that's where I, I went to my undergraduate school. and. Uh, you know, it's, when, I, when I got recognized for it, I, uh, I, was, I was basically, it was like I told you so. I told you so, the Harvard that, you know, if I'd gone to Harvard, maybe they would have gotten some of my, my success. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> the, the, the spirit of told you so runs deep in, in the, the family of Blythe Company. <laughs> Um, so, uh, you know, we have entrepreneurs in the room here. What, what, got, what gave you the entrepreneurial bug? What was it? that, you know, when did you decide you got to be an entrepreneur? You know, it's a funny thing about being an entrepreneur, at least in my situation, uh, there was no role model in my family uh, or anything like that. Uh, but, you know, it's like if you try things and you don't like it or you're not very good at it and you keep doing that and finally you wind up doing something that you're good at, which happened to be starting companies and turning them around and, and, and being that kind of person, uh, it all worked out like that, but I did a lot of different stuff. And along the way, even though I was in sort of kind of corporate environments or uh, consulting arrangements, I always had some kind of a spark of an idea. And so uh, I was successful in those things. And uh, I'll just tell you one thing that it's, it's not very entrepreneurial, but I, I, at a very, very young age, I was, I was 24 years old, and I got signed to the Coca Cola account in an advertising agency. And uh, Coca-Cola was a pretty state company in those days. It was before you guys were born, most of this room, except, of course, Dale and Linda. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the, uh, uh, and I, I, I went to the Coca-Cola manager and said, look, you guys just sound terrible on the radio. And I said, we've got to do something really, really different. And so I got them to sh totally shift their advertising program. And I was you know, 23, 24 years old. to. Uh, to basically, I recorded the, the Supremes in Motown with Barry Cordy and Petula Clark and all those other great names, Tom Jones, to tr totally change Coca-Cola. So even in a corporate environment, I was entrepreneurial. So I didn't know it at the time, but I kept rejecting you know, the bosses and stuff like that. And so basically, I think you kind of find out what you want to do over time. So the process of elimination, that's, you know, it's, I'm sure many of you came to entrepreneurship the exact same way. Uh, although I've never retained the Supremes to do anything. <laughs> that, that's quite, yeah. uh, quite an accomplishment. Things with Coke. Yeah. 
Um, talk to me about some of your, uh, a lot of people don't know this about you because you're so renowned for what you've done in the candle business. You're, in fact, they call him the candle man uh, in, in uh, many circles. Uh, but before that, you had you'd done a lot of mergers, acquisitions, yep. a lot of investing as the uh, senior partner at, at, at Sprout, which later is uh, DLJ. So what were some of the highlights of your career? I know you were a CEO of two companies for a, a period of time yep. prior to Party Light. Yeah, yeah, I know. We did some fun investing. Uh, I don't know if everyone remember when CB Radio, Citizens Band Radio, before the when the oil crisis happened back in the 70s. That was a great success uh, we had made an investment in. But uh, yeah, I, I, I decided that I really wanted to work with smaller companies, and uh, I did that. And, and then people asked me to come, in their, come into their companies and when they got in trouble, and so I did a couple of those. I was the CEO of a couple of companies that were really, really in bad shape and turned them around, and uh, that kind of led to me what, I'm, what I started doing with uh, the candle company. Excellent. Now, one of the things, we, we hear the story of Party Light, you acquired it at a, at a minimal amount. You certainly have invested yep. a, a substantial more in Vaisalis than you did in Party Light when you acquired it. Yep. Um, uh, how hands-on were you at the beginning? So, you know, you built this company into an 800 plus million dollar uh, global entity. Uh, how, how much hands-on were you in the development of leaders, the culture, and the building of the business at the beginning? Well, when we, I first uh, learned about Party Light, it was part of a, a, a company that we acquired and it was called Colonial Candle. And uh, I didn't really know anything about direct selling at the time. Uh, and I was fascinated by it because I, I said, boy, this is, this is another great opportunity to learn for myself. So for a year, I became president of Party Light uh, back in uh, 1990. And we were just, uh, it was very small. It was doing less than seven million in sales, not, not very profitable. And I, I went in there and, and talked to the management team and you know, tried to find out who the best people were. And I said, listen, guys, I think this could be a $100 million company. And they thought I was nuts. But, uh, and then when we got to $100 million, I said, this could be a $200 million company. But it was all fact-based. I, I had good reasons for doing that. So, uh, but I had a, the first year I was, I was the president because I had to learn about direct selling and what it was all about because it's a very wonderful business. And I've seen so many people personally grow in it. One, one of the, the mantras in your office, there's a, there's a, there's a picture, I think it's a Nike it's ad, a Nike, yeah. and there's a gal who's exhausted, and she's sitting on a bench, she's clearly worked out, she's sweating in, in workout gear, and underneath it it says, there is no finish line. Yeah. I recall being in your office and I asked you what the significance of that, will you share with them? Well, I, th I think that's true, I, I think that there is no finish line because uh, as soon as you start resting on your laurels, uh, it's all downhill. I mean, you either either are growing or you're declining, uh, and so there's no finish line. And and you know, I, I, you reminded me just now. You know, there's three words I've used at Blythe and in, in, in the, in the companies the company I've been involved in. And there's three words, and and, and, and Ryan loves these. One is one is Latin, and one is Japanese, and one is Greek. And, you know these, don't, and they they fit in with the no finish. It's Meliora. Kaizen and Amphiloskepsis. And Meliora means never being satisfied, meaning always, wherever you're doing, there's always an opportunity to improve. And I've drilled that through our organization as much as I could. Sound familiar? I, I, I've been the recipient of, of uh, <laughs> such philosophies. Kaizen means, in Japanese, while you're doing Meliora, even though the different languages, is do it in, in steps that you can manage. Don't, don't jump so far that you have to fall back. Jump in things that are manageable and that you can make it and keep growing. So I think Kaizen is a wonderful word because that way the growth that you're having is sustainable. And third is, which is probably reflective of almost everyone in this room at some time, is amphiloskepsis. It's a Greek word which basically means looking inward and seeing where your navel is taking you and saying, is my navel taking to me in the direction I want to go or do I have to do something to improve my position in life? So those are the three words I've used, Latin, Japanese, and Greek. And I've collected those words over my business career, which I thought were very meaningful to me. Yeah, you, you can see the type of education we receive in, you know, behind closed doors in the boardroom and over the years of, of uh, being a part of the, uh, you know, the Gergen family through investments and so forth. So it's amazing. Uh, one of the things that's, that's most amazing, I early on in my career at Sky Pipeline, I had to uh, personally guarantee every piece of debt possible. And at one point, I'd racked up uh, uh, millions of dollars in guarantees. Uh, some of the entrepreneurs in the room here have to actually go into debt to an extent yep. in order for them to build their business, to get on yep. a plane flight and get here, 
uh, in order for you guys to build your business. And I've had to do it, you've had to do it. So talk about bootstrapping. I know that's something that you, oh, yeah. you know a lot of. Oh yeah, that, there's no question about it. You know, it's, it's uh, you know, I personally guaranteed uh, a lot of debt. Uh, personally guaranteed debt every, every, every year. Whenever we did something and we needed more money from the bank, I had a basically personally guarantee. I never asked any of my colleagues at the company to do it. I, I took it all on myself. And uh, the, uh, but you know, I, I think if you have either, either a great Yiddish word, chutzpah, chutzpah, or you have a lot of self-confidence in yourself, or you're just plain nuts, you, you personally guarantee stuff. And that's what I did a lot of. <laughs> Well, you know, you, you, a lot of us had to get our businesses off the ground. We had to make those investments. And, you know, there's good debt and there's bad debt. We always talk about that. Yeah. Investing in a business is good debt. Buying Louis Vuitton lugs on, uh, no, luggage no, is not good no, debt. No, no. Um, you know, you know our BMW programs told you so. And, and backstage, you were sharing with me a told you so moment that you had yeah. when you left Sprout Capital, yep. uh, which later is DLJ. For those of you not familiar, DLJ is one of the preeminent, premier investment banks out there. Yep. This is the biggest, not the biggest, but the... It's a, one of the highest positions you can have yeah. on Wall Street is yeah. to be a partner or a president of that. So yeah. uh, why don't you share with them the story, the told you so moment you had yeah. uh, with that. DLJ has subsequently been acquired by a larger investment bank, but, but when I was there, it was a, a very elite investment banking firm and it was public. And when I, and I told the senior guy I work with, uh, I was the managing partner of Sprout and he was in the DLJ and he was a president. And he said, you shouldn't leave, Bob. You can become president someday. And I said, well, I think I'm going to try this little candle company and see what happens. So anyway, this guy was a really smart guy, very capable guy. And I, I bumped into him in the mid-90s after I had left in the late 80s. And he says, I can't believe you're on the Forbes 400. What is this? Anyway, so, I told you so. <laughs> <laughs> you know. There, there, there's still some people on my list I'd like to deliver, I told you so, and, and I'll, I'll mail them a copy of uh, Forbes 400, for, the Forbes 400 list when I do make it on there. And I know some of you get to mail copies of Success Magazine uh, and your story and your profile and, and your picture out this weekend as a nice little uh, told you so moment. So, uh, uh, you know, uh, that, that's an amazing story, Bob. One, another quick question that, I, that, that, uh, that we have here is, you know, when did you know you were going to be a successful entrepreneur? That's, Boy, that's, that's, that's a tough, tough one. That's a tough one. That is a very, very tough one. I, well, you know, I, I, don't, I don't look back. I, I, I've always set objectives every year. In fact, I, I had the discipline uh, when I got involved in, in the own comp my own company, which was Candle Corp and then Blythe and Party Light. I made written objectives every year. And so I... I you know, you just kind of, kind of say, if you follow the other things I just mentioned about no finish line and the three words I mentioned, I, I don't know if you ever kind of realize it. it. You just kind of do it because it's kind of part of you. So if you haven't set your goals uh, and your objectives for this year, you'd recommend the folks probably I do recommend, that? I recommend doing it every single year, whether you do it in December or January, and then look through periodically during the year, whether it's every three months or every six months or whatever it is, it is a wonderful, wonderful discipline because obviously as you're growing your business and growing the people that you're working with, you will have new goals for the new year. And I think that's really important because saying so doesn't make it. Putting it in writing makes a difference. Got it. That's good advice. I follow it as well. Um, you know, I asked you, and it was interesting, I said, what did it feel like? Because at Vicelis, you know, we've been talking about one day having this uh, company become a billion dollar company. And, whether that happens five years from now or 10 years from now, uh, you know, depends a lot on the environment and so forth. But what did it feel like when you actually generated that billion dollars in annual sales? What did it feel like? Well, it was terrific. The, uh, and, and the, it, we were 50 million in 1990. We were a billion in, in uh, 2000. So it was absolutely a terrific, a terrific experience. And so that's, that's really something. Yeah. <laughs> Now, now I, I asked him, I said, uh, did you throw a party? Because, you know, I, I, you, everyone here knows I like to have a lot of fun. And I thought, I'm, you know, I'm trying to get him to fund the billion dollar uh, party. <laughs> and uh, you, you, ironically, you said no. No, not no. at all. Just keep moving. Yeah. You know, and I, I thought, you know, the, and when we have these conversations, and I asked that, and he goes, there's no finish line. 
right? So, yeah. you know, I'm asking him, did you throw a party? Was it a big celebration? He goes, no, there's no finish line. Yeah, just keep working away yeah, at it. Just keep working. Um, well, you know, one of the, the things that, uh, you know, we admire about you, not only have you accumulated wealth and success through entrepreneurship, but you've also been giving back. You've done yeah. a lot of, yeah. of giving. What kind of causes are you passionate about? We uh, primarily give uh, either to educational uh, institutions or in our community uh, in a broad base. Uh, not only, well, not only the universities that, that, that were very supportive of me when I didn't have any money, but uh, there's a, Bridgeport is a, is, a, is a relatively large, poor town in Connecticut, and uh, we've been supporting uh, 100 kids every year to go to, go to, go to school uh, from K through uh, eight, and, uh, and uh, the, their, their parents are all below the poverty line, and uh, it's really great talking to those kids. And, and you hope that you can, you can do something like that. And we also support REACH for uh, Hispanic girls in the Greenwich community uh, to go to uh, summer school so they can uh, do better in school. And we just do a whole bunch of stuff like that. And uh, the reason is that we support education because it was my way out of my life. Uh, and uh, I think you know, everyone has to find what those things are that make a difference in their life, and education made a great deal of difference. And while we've given for, for disease, disease cures and, and, and research in that area, uh, education has always been a very, very strong point of where I'm coming from because of my personal experience. And I think that's true for everyone in this room. You all have a, a particular need, either you had a, a person who are in your family who has got a, a disease or unhealthiness or a certain experience, you want to feel behind that one, and education just makes it for me. It's amazing because you don't, you don't seek uh, public limelight, you don't do press releases. Nope. I, mean, I, I, in fact, I did not know until now that, that the Gergen Foundation supported 100 children uh, a year. And uh, you know, it's, it's interesting because your, your style is very much laid back, no yeah. smoke and mirrors. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> when I'm overly optimistic, uh, he lets me know it, uh, <laughs> uh, generally with a follow-up conversation or call. So how, how did you, <laughs> always with a follow-up conversation, yeah, sometimes yeah. by telephone. Yeah, uh, yeah. And so uh, how did you adopt this style? You know, direct sales is renowned for people being flashy and smoke and mirrors, yeah. and, and you're the exact opposite of that. So how did you, you adopt that style? Well, I love to dance. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, it's, uh, I don't know, I, I, you know, it's, you know, if you played a lot of sports, for example, I played a lot of sports, and you'd, you'd very, I've mean, always been an A-plus uh, on, on a basketball court, or, or others, I played a lot of basketball, uh, and New York City basketball is pretty tough. And uh, so I don't know, I, I just, I just, I think you can get things done without, without being flashy, but on the other hand, I think you have to be inspirational, and I try to be aspirational to people, uh, by my conduct and by the strength of my thoughts in terms of, like I talked about objective setting, about being very focused uh, and trying really to get those things achievement, uh, achieved, and I think that really makes a difference. So uh, whether I'm jumping up and down and dancing or whether I'm giving a speech, I've, I've talked to a lot of people obviously in the direct selling world. and. Uh, uh, I think there's a, just a different way of achieving goals, and it's my style is my style. I'm comfortable with my style. Yeah, we, we are very comfortable with it as well. Uh, I tweeted, and you know, he and I were sharing some information about Twitter and, and some of these things at a dinner that we had not too long ago, and he's just like, no thanks. Um, but I, I tweeted... Uh, I try to avoid Twitter. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> for I, so for I, reasons. I tweeted, what questions uh, would certain people have in the audience and whatnot uh, for you? And, and some folks wrote in online some pretty profound questions. Uh, Shanda Whitney wrote, what always kept him moving forward? So what always kept him moving forward? Oh God, probably, uh, probably my, you know, I think the way I was brought up by my mother and uh, by me just being terribly competitive and, and you know, when you've had a really tough childhood, you just keep moving forward. You never know what's gonna happen. Got it, great answer. Kathleen, uh, Kath, Kathleen Fitzpatrick said, what kind of talk do you have with yourself when you know you're overworking? <laughs> I know I'm overworking when people give me books like Men Who Do Too Much. <laughs> there is a book called that, by the way. There's a what, book. What's there, the name of the book? <laughs> For Men Who Do Too Much. For Men Who Do Too Much. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you, take a, you take a big breath. Uh, you know, I, I, the, way I, the way 
I did. I took like took little mini breaks, and uh, I don't like two week vacations. I take like three days, and that was been my style, uh, in, in my business career, and uh, and so I think that's. That was how I regenerated and got the batteries going again. So you recharge with, with mini breaks as mini opposed breaks. to long-term breaks. Yeah, mini breaks. I think that's good advice, especially when you have a, uh, you know, a, a, a small business that you're starting up that yeah. requires your constant attention. You can't take two weeks off. Okay? And your personal guarantee. Yeah, that's your personal <laughs> guarantee. Uh, Pappy Baker said, uh, what were your reasons for investing in Visalis? Well, you know, we already had the success story of Party Light, and, I, and as I, I've mentioned to people that I've seen so many men and women uh, just absolutely blossom with success. I've, had, I've met people who couldn't give a talk to three people, and now they can give them to 300 or 20 or 3,000. Just tremendous confidence. I've seen them cha to totally change in how they carry themselves. Uh, they become role models for their family, uh, their children, their daughters, their sons. She say, my father, my mom does this and they like to pitch in and help them like that, and it's kind of like a mini business. I've just seen so much, it, to me, it's part of the American dream. I wear this American flag be, all, every day, by the way, every day, except when I'm just playing sports or something, because only in America can you do this. I really believe it. Um, you know, we're, we're very uh, transparent with our distributors. We, we shared with them what we went through during the recession. Yep. Uh, obviously, you... Well, it was painful. It was painful. <laughs> it was, I, I, I got to... He, he's, uh, 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 he, can give, he can deliver pain in uh, large doses when uh, oh, we no, were going no, through no. some tough no, times. No, 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 no. And I, I share uh, with the team there what it was like when we were going through that recession. And, you know, it's public information that the founders and, and uh, the Gergens had to put money back into Vaisalus to continue to rebuild it, yep. to launch Body by Vi. And, uh, and uh, you know, Rob and Todd and yourself and, you know, uh, and the Vaisalus management team, we got together and we did a lot of hard work yep. to get to where we are today. Right. Um, why don't you share with them, you know, uh, you've been through recessions, you've been through ups, you've been through downs, you have, uh, you know, this was our first, so it was probably more scary for us than you. Uh, well, no, it's, uh, I, I, you know, we, we Obviously, the speed bump with the way the economy happened after 2008 and everyone, I mean, uh, it was just a terrific speed bump for everybody and I'm sure many people in this, in this room. But, you know, the three founders really stepped up to it. We, we talked a lot about what was important, what was, what, was, what was the foundation, what were the fundamentals, what, what are we really all about? And they really, they really took it on themselves. I think they did an absolutely fantastic job. They really, really did, and it's great. Thank you. True. It's true. Thank you. You know, one of the one of the principles we had, and, and when I first had the meeting with uh, the Gergens, I I knew I still don't know what I don't know, but I didn't know anything back then, and I know that. And uh, they said the most important thing you can do is get the checks out on time, and get the product out on time. And one of the things we're really proud of as founders is we've never missed a distributor paycheck, no matter how bad the times were. Uh, no matter what, in the six years that we've been in business. So uh, yeah. it was his philosophy uh, and the things that he taught us and the Gergens and, and Blythe and Party Light and our counterparts and the other management teams of those companies that we share, you know, uh, uh, the collective knowledge that got us through that. Uh, I'm going to ask you one, uh, one more question. How important is Vaisalus to Blythe? Well, it's terrific. It, it really is the... Is the the primary growth vehicle for Blythe today. It absolutely is. It's, it's growing the fastest. Uh, you know, there's no reason why the people in this room and the people you recruit and bring on board can't, can't have this to be bigger than, than Party Light. There's just no reason why we can't. You've got the right products, you've got the right leadership. There's no reason why you can't do that. So keep doing what you're doing. Uh, I always also talk little, little things, I think which is, Vice Ellis has done a great job, is delivering, in a very rapid growth period, delivering the products to the customer on time, that's really important, and Vice Ellis has done an incredible job. So there's a lot more people behind the three founders who are making that happen. So that's what we gotta do. There's no reason why this can't be bigger than Party Light. Excellent, guys.
Please give it up for Mr. Bob Durbin. Thank you, Bob. Thank you. Good to see you. Thank you.